like you to continue with me in worship as we turn to God's Word. Matthew chapter 5 is our next text, please. And I ask you to go there as we continue to remember to pray and as we praying for our government leaders. And of course, we need to be praying for uh, our friends to the south, for the Americans amongst us and the United States as they vote this Tuesday. I think it's just uh, in Tuesday. I pray for God to work there as well. Pray for wisdom and grace. Pray for our brothers and sisters in the States too, that whatever outcome happens, they will know that God is in control. Nothing happens outside of his determination. So we pray for those who are going through these times as well. In Matthew chapter 5, we also have a prayer, or at least the Lord's teaching on prayer. Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. I'd like to read, beginning in verse 5, Matthew chapter 6, and read to verse 15. Word of God says this, And when you pray, Jesus says, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. As some of the other manuscripts would say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want us this morning to think about fathers. Not the human fathers, per se. It's not Father's Day, kids. So if you want to go buy your daddy a present, I'm sure he'd be quite happy for that. So take that as it is. No, we're not talking about the fatherhood of God. We began a couple of weeks ago in this series on the Trinity, trying to unpack from the Scriptures this concept of God, this reminder from Scripture as to who He really is, this triune God. And a picture there is very much of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We've learned, of course, that there is only one and true God, but in the unity of this one God, the Godhead, there are three essential, co-eternal, if you will, persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And even last week, we walked through that, reminding ourselves that there is one God. This God is three persons, and each person of the Godhead is fully God. Or to help simplify it, we use that little symbol that we got to use last week called the, the Trinity Shield, or whatever you want to call it. It's very an old symbol. It reminds us of what we're learning here, is that there's one God. You'll see that in the center of the screen. One God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you'll notice that each of them, it says, is God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. But you notice also that the Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. They are one God, all God, but they have separate persons in that unity of the Godhead. Now, as we looked last week, about, or two weeks ago, about the incomprehensibility of God, that fits in there very well, doesn't it? To be able to understand Something that God has designed is beyond our ability. And yet, as we've been studying this theme, it reminds us of the intricate beauty of God in blessing us as the Trinity. And so again, today and next week and Lord willing, the week after, we'll look at the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we want to talk about the Father today in light of the table before us because it is Communion Sunday. What distinguishes us here today is that we believe very much that God is our Father. Romans chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul in beginning that letter says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. But what does that mean? How are we to understand the idea of God as Father? Yes, I recognize that all of us here can understand to a certain degree the idea of a Father. As I mentioned, we're not talking about human fathers today, but that's a good picture, isn't it? But of course, when we talk about God as a father, it's something that's beyond us, isn't it? 
because God is not sinful. Human fathers are. God the Father doesn't fail, but human fathers fail. We know that. Yes, and most of the kids are nodding their heads. Yes, we know our fathers fail. It's just part of the world. And yet we see pictures in our own fathers that in a larger and perfect measure are seen in God himself. And so what I'd like to do is really begin in this text that I gave you and then kind of sweep through Scripture again and see what does the Bible tell us about the fatherhood of God? And at the end, what does it have to do with us? So the first thing we have to understand that when we look at the Trinity, God the Father is that part of the Trinity that basically initiates all things. We look at the Scriptures and see that God is the initiator of creation, of salvation, of all of these aspects. He is the sovereign Lord, Father over everything. Now, as we'll see in the Son and the Spirit, they are equally in every role, uh, holy and perfect as God the Father is, but there's a specific role that the Father plays. And that's one of the reasons why we have the word for it, a father. Even here in Matthew chapter 5, as I read that text for you, you'll notice that Jesus himself gives us some clues from his own life about this father. He tells us to pray in the name of the heavenly father as he prays. We see here that this father knows our needs before we even tell him. There are aspects, obviously, of this father that take us far beyond our own understanding. But what are they? Well, we'll have three headings today. The first is I want us to start in the Old Testament. And just like we learned from the Trinity that things are kind of held in shadows and mysterious in the Old Testament, it begins, uh, becomes more clear as you go through the Scriptures, I want to see that in the context of the Heavenly Father. First, we look at it in terms of Father in the Old Testament. Generally, what we see here is both Father as Creator, but also significant Father as the forgiving and redeeming God of Israel. If you do a, a study in this theme, you'll discover that in the Old Testament, you will not find a lot of references to Father in this way as God. But there are two that are really helpful for us to understand what we see in the Old Testament. The first is in uh, Isaiah 63, the text that I had read earlier for you. Take your Bibles and turn there for a moment. And it really runs into a second text, and that's in chapter 64. In Isaiah, you're coming to the end of Isaiah's prophecy and the writings that God has laid out for him. And in Isaiah 63, there's talk of repentance, there's talk of returning to the Lord and God's blessing and mercy upon his people. And so we read those verses there in 63, beginning in 15, calling out to God, look down from heaven and see, from your lofty throne, holy and glorious. And here's the idea of separation from God. Where are your zeal and your might, your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us? What was a the running theme of the Old Testament Israel people, Israelites, is that they would sin and they would cause this separation and the feeling would be, well, where are you, God? And notice their cry in verse 16. But you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, Lord, are our father. And notice, our redeemer from of old is your name. Similarly, let your eyes go down to chapter 64 and verse 7, where again this crying out to God. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet, verse 8 says, you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are your people. Now, some will look at these texts and saying, well, Isaiah is just referring to God as the creator God. He made them, but no, you can't see it that way. Because underneath this is the understanding that God is the covenant God of Israel. The references to Abraham that he's made there. God made a pledge to Israel through Abraham and what he would do in making them a great nations. And so there was the covenant promise that God made to Abraham that is resounding here in Isaiah's language. You are our redeemer. It's not just that God created everyone. He did that, but he also is the father of a special people. You see that there? In understanding the, the sort of big picture of the scriptures, we have to see the covenant promises of God to this people specifically. He did not make this covenant with everyone. He made it with a specific people themselves, the Israelites. 
Now, there are other texts in the Old Testament, while they don't use the word father in this way, the language is very much of father-children relationship. For instance, back in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, you are the children of the Lord your God, it says. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. And the emphasis of the children of the Lord, the children of Israel, if we call them that, there's the understanding of, of relationship with the Father. Or even in the Psalms, the wonderful verse 13 of Psalm 103. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So the images you see of fatherhood become fairly distinct in the Old Testament, even though not as full as we'll see later on in the New Testament. Why is this important? Because it reminds us here that in each case, God is showing us that he has a people that he has redeemed. And not only is he the creator God, but he has a special love for a special people. Now we'll see how that manifests itself in the New Testament. But it shows us the relationship that Israel had with their God. Notice as father. Now, that same theme, when we move to the New Testament, the father in the New Testament, the same theme of God as creator God is evident there, but now we begin to see more intimate language of who this God is as a father, and the fundamental place we see that is through Jesus Christ. If you went back to Matthew 5, where we looked at the Lord's Prayer, how the Lord teaches us to pray, Jesus says, uh, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. The reminder now is that the Father has brought in a more intimate reality to them, but the connection is first and foremost in Jesus Christ, God's relationship to the Son. If you will, think of it in terms of the incarnation, where God the Father sends the Son to be born uh, of a Virgin Mary at Bethlehem, right? The Father's engaging the Son into the world. So when Jesus comes in, when the Son of God comes into the earth, He is the, the manifestation, if you will, of the Father. When, when Jesus say, if you have seen me, you have seen whom? The Father, right? So you cannot escape now that Christ has come. The picture of God as Father just starts to burst forth, doesn't it? Because there's intimacy with Jesus, the Son, and the Father. He prays to the Father. He communes with the Father. He says, my, will is, my purpose is to do the will of my Father. There's always that connection there. And the New Testament just starts to lay that out for us. And it's interesting that this connection of the Son of God and Jesus Christ as he comes with the Father is the very thing that got Christ in, in trouble, isn't it? In John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said this, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only that he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The very thing that Jesus declares got him in trouble. My father is always working to this very day, and I too am working. And this was scandalous. Because for the Jew, you didn't think of God in that way. And for Jesus to do that, breaking the Sabbath, that's one thing. But calling himself God, because God is his Father. And so that connection, that relationship, begins to build throughout the New Testament. And there's one word that comes to my mind when this is happening, and it's the word intimacy. That God, though he has not changed, he's the same God as he was in the Old Testament. As a father, the intimacy of his relationship with his people is beginning to be seen. It's seen in his relationship to his son, Jesus Christ. And it is also seen, as we'll notice in a moment, in you and me. Now, now the reason I begin there in that in more of a lesson kind of thing is to educate you, but it's also to put our, our thinking in the right mode. Because don't miss my point here that if we're going to understand something of the significance of the communion table, we have to understand the role of God as a father. That's critical. And so the scriptures are building towards this throughout the Old and New Testament. And there are just a whole slew of verses in the New Testament you, you can look at, which refer to God in this way as Father and Redeemer. And that's where I'd like you to go with me now. We think about God in the Old Testament, uh, Father in the Old Testament, Father in the New Testament. 
But basically now, what about the Father in us? In other words, what does this have to do with you and me? Well, plenty. And you know of most of what that is. But let's just look at this from the scriptural standpoint as to how this affects you and I. Because this is where it's important. Who is God as my Father? And what is my relationship to Him? Well, as I noted, the first thing to understand is that this understanding of God the Father, and in particular, my relationship to Him, begins with the connection between the Father and the Son. I've already mentioned how Jesus, the Son, is related to the Father in that way. There's an intimate relationship. But that's the connection for you and me, right? We'll look at this a little later, particularly on the table, is there is no connection with the Heavenly Father if we don't go through Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Jesus said, you have to go to the Father through me. It's an exclusive entry, if you will. So if we think we can have somehow a relationship to God the Father, as some religions and people might do, but exclude Jesus Christ, it doesn't happen. And so to know God as my Father is to see first the connection between the Father and the Son. You can jot down a couple of verses if you want to look at these later. John 20, verse 17. Jesus said to the disciples, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending, listen, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Isn't that staggering? It is to me. Because Jesus isn't just telling us there is, look, I am the Son of the Father, but He's also your Father as well, if you know Him through me. He's my God, and He's your God. And now, all of a sudden, the mystery of God the Father begins to crack open here. Because Jesus Himself is that connecting point. And He says, if, if you love me, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The relationship is through that. So let me just pause very briefly, take a breath, and ponder for yourself whether or not you know the Heavenly Father as your Lord and Master. If you don't know Him through Jesus Christ, then you don't know Him. But that even now you begin to see that your need for repentance and faith and trust in Christ alone to, to follow after Him so that you might know the love of the Heavenly Father. It is through Jesus that we see this. And that's the second point. It, it, it starts to talk about our lives as children of God. And this whole concept of the fatherhood of God for us here speaks to our inheritance. Jesus is the connection, but it also speaks to our inheritance. I, I, do you want to talk about inheritance today? How much you might get when somebody else dies and that idea somebody's leaving something to you? Put that all aside for a moment and consider biblically our inheritance if we are children of this heavenly father. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it gloriously speaks of this. The Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And listen, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in the glory. What is that verse telling us as we study through Romans together? It reminds us that if we are God's children, we are heirs. We're His children... But we're heirs to the promise. That is that God, for His children, has promised something even greater than what you have now. Your inheritance. Yes, life for Christ here. The blessing spiritually that you enjoy. But heaven one day. And the grand, glorious presence of our Heavenly Father. Not presence, T-S, but C-E. That is, in His presence. We'll enjoy that one day. Now, again, it's staggering beyond belief, but there it is. That's because He's our Heavenly Father. Not only does it speak of our inheritance, it speaks also to our status of who we are. It mentioned there, we're His children. But look at another verse with me in Galatians chapter 4, and Romans speaks of this as well. This is what Paul says in Galatians. Because, verses 6 and 7 of Galatians 4, if you're taking notes. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are His child, God has made you also an heir. And the connection there is in Romans 8, 15, where it says, The Spirit has received, had brought about your adoption to sonship. We've been brought into the family of God. He's adopted us. 
And our status now is as children, not as slaves. We were once slaves and lost in fear, but now we're his children. We have changed. God has changed us. And now because of the adoption process through the cross of Jesus Christ, we have the full status as children, as heirs. It's changed. Isn't that great? We've gone from those who had nothing but condemnation to expect in our lives to those who have everything in Jesus' name. It's a reminder to us then, this change of status is something, and I love when it says it there, that we call out to him, Abba, Father. Some loosely translate it, Daddy, but I don't think that quite captures it. But it's an intimate reference to my Heavenly Father. It's not a formal, structural thing, but it's this intimate relationship. He loves me as his child and beckons me to his presence and, and draws me in to be with him because he loves me. That's my status now. Irrespective of my background, regardless of what I've faced in life, if I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I am now one of his children, and he loves me as his own. And that's because he's my father and chooses to do so. Further to that, just run quickly, quickly with me through these. I'm not sure what number I'm on here. I think I'm on number four. What did I just tell you? Yeah, thank you. I had three. Number four. It speaks to our relationship with each other. The idea of how we relate one to another, our fellowship with each other. Listen, it's not that we just relate to God as our Father, but now we relate to each other as brothers and sisters. Again, a text for you, 1 John 1, 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We have intimate fellowship with our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior. And because of that, we have fellowship one with another. Now, that's one that you need to chew on a little bit. Because just as you have fellowship with your Father, and I trust you do that, your Heavenly Father, through the Word and prayer and spiritual connection with your Heavenly Father, you're to have that with each other as Christians. I cannot just look out at this group of people here and saying, yes, these are my brothers and sisters. I, I need to love them and, and preach to them and care for them. Yes, yes, there's all that. But I need to have fellowship with them. I need to love them as my own family. I need to work into their lives, my life, because that's what God has called me to do. And you need to do that as well. You can't just look around the place and saying, yes, yes, one day I'll get to know that person or do this. You need to begin to see, here's your family. And beyond this, not just us. And I need to pour my heart into theirs because that's the fellowship I have with my Heavenly Father. Do you realize, you see, we couldn't have that if we didn't have our Heavenly Father. Further to that, number five, it speaks to the depth of His love for us. Not just the fellowship we have, but the depth of His love for us. And here's one that's a bit hard to swallow. In Hebrews chapter 12, again, read the whole chapter. But there, uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the love the Father has for His children. And he says this, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. He's saying, if you're my children, then you'll be disciplined. Now, the kids are cringing a little bit. It doesn't mean punishment. It doesn't mean God is giving us a spanking. Oh, you're not supposed to do that, I guess, in our day and age. But he's not, not punishing us. But it's disciplining. He's training us so that we might serve Him better and glorify Him. And sometimes that discipline is very painful. The challenges that God brings through us, and this shows the significance of His love, He will bring us through the depth of difficulties because He loves us and wants to discipline us. Now, I'm, I'm the first one to admit that if you had two paths to choose and they were equally legitimate, one was easy, no struggles, and way you go to heaven. The other is like through all sorts of problems and pain and suffering. Which one am I going to choose? I'm going the easy path. Guaranteed, 100%. And, and unless you're, you're a particularly nasty person, you'll take that one as well. Ah, but see, we're missing the point. The point is because of God as a father loves us, that he knows what's best for us. He knows the way in which we'll be better prepared to serve him and honor him. And He loves us so much that He'll give that to us. It's an incredible love of our Father. 
and be our Father. He shows the depths of that. And that brings us then to this final point, is that that love God has for us shows that it speaks here of the foundation of our salvation itself. It really speaks to the root of our salvation in Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Listen to one of my favorite verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. As Peter is beginning his letter, he says, To God's elect, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, unto obedience to Jesus Christ. It is God, in his love before time ever began, who chose to save me. It's the Father, in wonderful love, before you and I ever came upon this world, set his affections upon me, and he says, my love for this of my chosen one, Les Clemens, will be upon him, and I will save him. It's a glorious picture that the fatherhood of God is the very foundation of the work of Christ on the cross. You can't separate them. Try that if you can. Try and talk about God the Father and loving us without the cross. Take that out of the picture. What does it look like? It's lost its effectiveness. It has no power. It can't do anything, you see. And so the very reality of God as Father requires the cross to be there so that Christ might bear the penalty for my sins, the wrath of God upon him, that we might become children. And without that, we're not his children. Without that, he's my creator, but he's not my father. Massively important, but also wonderfully refreshing when we understand this. That God in his love as my heavenly Father chose to send himself as the Son into this world to die on the cross to take away my sins so that I might glorify him as his child. Isn't that incredible? And again, if, if you're not a Christian here today, think about that. All you have outside of a relationship with God is that he's your creator and he'll be your judge one day. And you'll have to stand before him in your own strength. See today the need for salvation. And put your trust in him alone. And if you are a Christian, see here the wonders of God's grace to your heart. Bow in rejoicing worship. Seek his face. Cultivate that relationship so that you might know him truly as your father and bring him praise and glory. And that's the table we're going to gather around this time to remind us of that incredible love of our father. As we do that, we want to sing a hymn or have a hymn played for us and reminded of the grace of God at that time. And so let's remain seated. I'm going to pray and then we'll hear this hymn of preparation for the table. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the wonders of your grace as our loving Heavenly Father. Lord, as we have the words from Scripture ringing in our ears here, prepare our hearts around this table that as we remember this sacrifice, you might once again guide and direct us to be faithful servants. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.